How many people do you know these days with a neurological disorder? How many family members or people in your circle of friends have something like multiple sclerosis or chronic headaches? How about a brain tumor? Studies in the New England Journal of Medicine show a growing trend in the rate of such disorders in recent years. Perhaps like me, you've never given the issue much thought. But in 2002, I could no longer ignore it. I also became a statistic when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. It was the summer of the Great Fire in Tucson, Arizona, when I began my research and traveled across this country to find the truth. Talk a little bit about that, or is that true, or is that... Well, yeah, the, you know, the technology we have in looking at the brain has changed rather dramatically. Now, the increase in brain tumors has nothing to do with our ability to see these things, because that's been looked at. And the studies have shown that it's a real increase in brain tumors. It has nothing to do with our improvements in technology. The National Cancer Institute recorded an impressive increase in incident rates of primary brain cancer since 1985 and possibly as early as 1984. Dr. H.J. Roberts, director for the Palm Beach Institute for Medical Research, found this trend particularly disturbing. At a time when this trend was singularly attributed to more innovative scanning and diagnostic procedures, Roberts noticed a series of conflicting themes. First, Adequate brain scanning devices were widely available for at least 10 years prior to this report. Second, there were simply more people affected with brain cancer. They had nothing to do with the change in the way they were diagnosed or a different way of classifying the disease. Third, between 1983 and 1987, incidents of other forms of cancer outside the brain remained the same and in some cases declined. So why the vast increase in brain cancer and brain disorders since 1984? I'll refer to a published study by foremost neuroscientist Dr. John Olney. He suggests one likely candidate. In 1983, the U.S. population began ingesting significant quantities of a substance never before used for human consumption. Artificial sweetener aspartame was quickly introduced to consumers. In 1984, 6,900,000 pounds of aspartame was consumed by Americans. This rate doubles by the next year and continues to climb into the 90s. When it was fully marketed for pop and everything by uh, July to August of 1983, six months later by 1984, the brain tumor rate had already jumped 10% in the United States. The diabetes rate had jumped 30 percent and the incidence of brain lymphoma, a very aggressive and unusual type of brain tumor, jumped 60 percent. The uh, enormity of the problem is indicated by the fact that by 1988 in its own publication 80 percent of complaints about food and additives that were volunteered to the FDA. And again, it didn't have to be submitted, had to deal with aspartame products over 80 percent. You know, when you see these people uh, who say, well, you know, I take uh, MSG or NutraSweet and it doesn't seem to bother me at all, uh, they're more resistant to the obvious toxic effects, but they're still getting very subtle toxic effects that over many years is going to uh, produce obvious uh, disease in those persons. Some persons can be exposed the first time and break up with a rash, have terrible headache, and so they presumably have never been exposed to it before. Um, <clears throat> but on the other hand, people who've taken it over the long term and exposing the body to uh, large doses of the components of aspartame, then that's uh, in the realm of toxicity. And again, it, it's this variability in your sensitivity to toxins. Some people may notice very little of anything. 
a majority of people will have one of a number of symptoms because we know that the aspartame, because it is a poison that affects protein synthesis, because it affects the, how the synapse operates in the brain, and because it affects DNA, can affect numerous organs. So you can get a lot of different symptoms that seem unconnected. But in looking at the list of symptoms submitted to the FDA, most of them are neurological or in some way connected to the nervous system. Um, so the nervous system seems to be one of the areas that's most affected. So we see people have difficulty thinking. Uh, they feel like they're walking around in a cloud or a fog. It's a subchronic level. It's not like you go out and you drink a bottle of methanol and you have this acute reaction to it. Uh, what, we're ha what we're seeing over a period of time is this slow accumulation of toxins within the body that, have, that start to disrupt the, the, um, the normal activity of the brain and the endocrine system, which is controlled by the, by the brain itself. We know, we've known for a long time, that when you take in a lot of aspartame in conjunction with carbohydrates, you will decrease the availability of uh, L-tryptophan, which is the building block for serotonin. There's been a lot of media attention recently to serotonin, a very, very important neurotransmitter, important in mood regulation and a, and a variety of functions. Uh, aspartame is uh, an artificial sweetener, an additive, and it's a chemical. It's not a natural product, it's a chemical. The molecule is made up of three components. Two are amino acids, the so-called building blocks of protein. One is called phenylalanine, which is about 50% of the molecule. And the other is aspartic acid, which is like 40%. And the other 10% is a so-called methyl ester, which is soon as it's it swallowed, becomes free methyl alcohol, methanol, wood alcohol, which is a poison, a real poison. Uh, I realized that something was going awry, but I couldn't quite figure it out. And then after several years, putting, amalgamating this experience, and patient input. And it's very important that you listen to your patients because the great Dr. Osler said, listen to the patient. They're telling you what's wrong. I realized that the common denominator was the use of uh, aspartame products. And under various trade names, particularly NutraSweet, Equal, Crystallite, and so forth. I mean, there was just all kinds of things that, you know, the diet sodas, the, you know, I used to uh, eat jello all the time, you know, Cool Whip and gum. I used to, you know, eat chew gum constantly back then. Um, and so for years, I went on thinking what a smart person I am drinking Diet Coke instead of regular Coke. And, and, and also, I carried it into other things as well, so that when I would sweeten my tea, I sweeten it with, uh, with Equal. And so when the uh, low-cal Kool-Aid hit the market uh, in, I think it was April of 1983, I started using it. I started out for doing blood draws, and um, I, I did the blood draws. I like talking and everything, and so that was a good area for me to get into. I was always hyper and all that, and I would drink the diet sodas like crazy there because we had it at our disposal all the time. And so the further and further I got on, and then um, I did the Armed Forces Emergency ser Services with the disaster we work with um, people overseas during war wartime. Uh, I was a briefing attorney for a federal district judge, John H. Wood, the U.S. courthouse in San Antonio is named after him. And uh, then after serving as his briefing attorney for two years, I was appointed by Bill Sessions as assistant U.S. attorney for the Western District of Texas and uh, served in that capacity for a little bit over four years. And during that time, I was the president of the Federal Bar Association and very active in uh, legal matters and things like that. Had I seen the chemical formula on this product, I would never have touched it. You know, the, the poisonous effect of methyl alcohol and, and its methyl esters are, are well known. 
And uh, within a day or two of my starting to